In the Secret Language of Symbols by Dr. David Fontana, he notes that from ancient times, buildings have been seen as having a significant symbolic structure. Buildings reflect our inner aspirations, thus architecture is, in a way, a reflection of the soul of a people. He writes, the dimensions of many structures, particularly sacred structures, have been a strong influence on the symbolic meanings of form. Architects believe that following certain geometric guidelines would infuse their works with a sacred power. For example, Christian churches are traditionally constructed in the form of a cross, and the nave, where the worshippers congregate, symbolizes a ship bearing souls to Christ. Towers of Hindu temples, for example, represented cosmic mountains where the gods dwelt and humans could meet with them, similar to the biblical idea of the high places or meeting God on Mount Sinai. The great Buddhist temple in Java is in the form of a massive mandala, a representation of the cosmos in three dimensions. We're going to notice the similar pattern of three-dimensional structures and three three-dimensional sections, particularly in regard to Solomon's temple. And we're going to notice how this is fulfilled in the work of Christ, particularly in the Orthodox Church. There's the belief that amongst the world religions, there is an ancient skeletal structure from which all the world religions are kind of a split or a form of that. And then above all of those world religions is the ancient, ancient structure that gives rise to all the divisions and the distinctions. The idea being that through metaphysics or through some mystical practice or study, one could attain to this primal skeletal structure. As Orthodox, we don't believe that there is an ancient supra-religion from which all the religions are merely uh, frontispieces, but rather we think that there is the idea of the Logos Spermaticos. This is the idea that the seeds of the Logos are present everywhere. Uh, in nature, in thought, and even in world religions. This does not mean that all the world religions are true. Rather, it means that they do contain truths, they do, they, they do contain elements which point us to the Logos. In this regard, we can look at even the structure of sacred temples, ancient pagan religions, and even the world religions themselves, because they bear all kinds of commonalities which are universal which speak to some fundamental principle or need that humans have felt or have towards their conception of the transcendent or the divine. All ancient religions include elements such as the altar, the priesthood, the offering or the sacrifice, and in many cases the animal that was the representation of the individual offering would be a representative for him. It would be a situation where the animal stood in the place of the offerer as a form of atonement. This representation then uh, paid the blood offering that was due, due that the human couldn't pay. And so we get the idea, for example, in biblical religion of the scapegoat. Likewise, these temples had a holy place. Uh, many times the temples had places marked off in respect to other places. So you might have a holy place and then a holy of holies, for example. And the temple itself was set off as something holy because that's where the deity dwelt amongst the people. It was a meeting place between heaven and earth, or the temple itself was a form of heaven on earth. Temples also are set apart for sacred time. So just as there's sacred space, so also the festivals and the seasons and the calendar, which are marked off in a religious way, time itself is seen thus to be sacred. And this is covered uh, in great detail in Merkia Iliada's famous book, The Sacred and the Profane. Temples were also adorned with many iconic representations. This could be carvings, this could be statues, this could be idols. Uh, any kind of iconic representation usually filled the temple. And one of the commonalities that we see amongst the world religions that makes Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, unique, unique coming out of the Hebrew tradition and its revelation is the notion of the God of Israel being different than the gods of the nations. For one, this God didn't work with pre-existing matter. This God wasn't a manifestation of nature itself or one amongst many gods. There is one God, the Father of us all, Paul says, and that God is not worshipped as in the worship of creatures 
or the worship of death. God is distinct from creation and is uncreated. Creation comes to be ex nihilo or out of nothing, and so he can't be identified with anything in the created order, which would be a form of idolatry. Thus, as in most world religions, in animism or pantheism, you have a worship of the forces of nature or a personification of the various forces of nature. In Orthodox Christianity, in, uh, deriving from its Hebrew tradition, the God of the Old Testament, who is, of course, the father of us all, as Jesus says, the one God and Father, together with the angel of the Lord and his spirit, in other words, the Trinity present in the Old Testament. This God is distinct from the created order and is not worshipped in the same way as the pagan nations are. However, God did condescend at that time to speak to the people of Israel according to the type of worship that was understood by the peoples around them. So there were animal sacrifices, there was a priesthood, there was an altar, there was a holy place, and so forth. And these things signified something future to come. In other words, they weren't an end in themselves. The animal sacrifices didn't actually placate God. Rather, they pointed forward to something else that was coming that would be the fulfillment of those things. In other words, the reality of those things. For this talk, be sure and make your way over to chalk.com. Chalk has the best supplements out there. They're a great company. They're very red pilled. They support this show. Long time supporter. If you head over to chalk.com right now, you can get 50% off any of their products, anything especially relating to male vitality. You can boost testosterone naturally with products like Tonkat Elite, shown in peer reviewed studies to produce excellent results. Use the promo code J50, that's J A Y 50, to get 50% off any of these products. You can also set up recurring subscriptions to get the products every month. Do that using the promo code J53LIFE, that's J53LIFE at chalk.com. We should mention that in A Hero with a Thousand Faces, the classic comparative religion work from Joseph Campbell, comparing archetypes and patterns in various religions, he notes that temple symbolism in the ancient world bore a lot of similarities to the biblical idea. Again, this is not to confuse the systems, but to point out that there are seeds of the logos, even in these pagan religions. For example, in the hero's journey, sometimes he would have to go to the temple, and when he enters the temple, he goes inward to be, quote, born again. This disappearance corresponds to the passing of a worshiper into the temple where he is quickened by the recollection of who and what he is, essentially that he receives his name and identity here. Namely, he is merely dust and ashes. He is mortal. However, the transformation can lead to him becoming immortal. The temple interior also corresponds to the belly of a beast or a whale. This makes sense in regard to Jonah. We remember in, in scripture, the gospels, Jesus says that he will be in the heart of the earth, just like Jonah was in the heart of the whale. So we know that the temple corresponds to the structure of the world or the universe. It also represents the earth. And so being in the interior of the temple can also represent the interior of the whale. The temple, uh, Campbell writes, also represents heaven and the land beyond, above and below, the confines of the world. Thus, they can all be represented through this one simple and same image. This is why when the hero approaches the entrance of the temple, temples are usually flanked and defended by gargoyles, dragons, lions, devils, drawn swords, dwarves, winged bulls, etc. These are the threshold guardians. They exist to ward away in capable encounters so that those who might come to the higher place uh, would not do so in an unworthy way. These are preliminary embodiments of the dangerous aspects of the presence in the temple. And that could be a demonic presence. It could be a divine presence. Thus, the temple is a significant sign of metamorphosis. The hero's secular character remains with outside the temple. He sheds it as a snake as he enters through. Once he is inside, he may have be said to die to time and space, to return to the primordial womb, the world womb or the world navel, or even the Edenic paradise. And this is crucial because this is precisely something that is cru a key to biblical temple theology, that it is Eden itself on earth. 
The mere fact that anyone can physically walk past the temple guardians does not invalidate this significance. For if the intruder is incapable of encompassing the sanctuary, he has effectively remained without. Anyone unable to understand a god sees it as a devil and is thus defended from the approach. To read this allegorically, the passage into the temple is the hero's dive. It is his dive through the jaws of the whale. It is identical to various adventures, noting and picturing the life centering, life renewing action. So it's a kind of death and birth to enter in and to, in, and to exit out. And that is precisely what we will find throughout biblical temple symbology. The Jewish temple was built at Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac. In the Christian sense, the sacrifice of Isaac was a type. It was not intended to be a human sacrifice, but rather was a test of Abraham's faith, a public testimony, you could say, of his faith, which he showed and by which God said that he would provide a sacrifice. That sacrifice of a father sacrificing a son would be fulfilled ultimately in the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, the Logos, being sacrificed in the sense of offering his humanity in the incarnation as a sacrifice. Thus, we can see that the movement from tabernacle to temple, for example, is itself a image of a movement from a mortal body to an immortal body. The tabernacle being the Jews' uh, movable ceremonial temple structure that could be moved through the wilderness until they were able to settle in Jerusalem and Solomon could build the temple. The temple then being a permanent structure, the only legitimate place where worship could be offered. Inside the temple, as we know, uh, was the Edenic imagery. It was a restoration, a return to Eden, to the place that mankind had been uh, banished from. So the cherubim who in Genesis ban man from returning to the garden, we find that imagery throughout the temple to recall that this is the presence of Eden. It's not just the presence of Eden, it's also the presence of heaven on earth. But there's a structure to the temple that we have to notice, which is that there's the outer portico. This is where certain people could come, like Gentiles who worshipped the one true God of Israel. The inner portico or inner holy place, which was the location of the holy implements and instruments, such as the lampstands and the showbread. And then the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant stood. This threefold structure represents many things, but it also corresponds to Paul's description of the three heavens. This is important because on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would walk into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. This signified that there had been a restoration of communion and a forgiveness of sins for the people of Israel. Christ fulfills this as the high priest when he ascends into heaven. In other words, the ascension into the third heavens, the throne uh, throne room to sit at the right hand of God the Father according to the Psalms until his enemies are made his footstool is precisely the correspondence to the day of atonement when the high, the high priest would walk into the Holy of Holies. So in other words the entrance into the Holy of Holies corresponds to Jesus' ascent into the third heavens, the Holy of Holies in heaven, the true Holy of Holies. Because he is incarnate in our nature he is then able to present that same sacrifice in the divine liturgy, in the Eucharistic offering. Outside the temple, we see some implements that also correspond to what you will find in Orthodox theology. There's the bronze sea, which had 12 oxen, the 12 oxen representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and according to the New Testament, the 12 apostles who then bring baptism. Yes, the washing of these waters for entrance into the covenant would be extended to all the nations, and that is symbolized by the Bronze Sea. We notice that there's Yakin and Boaz, the two pillars in the front of the temple, and these correspond to the two trees, the Tree of Knowledge and the Tree of uh, Life. And they also correspond to an entrance into another world, another dimension, as we mentioned earlier. There's the Altar of Incense, that is what represents the prayers of the saints going up before God, this is described in the book of, the, uh, of Revelations, which we believe is a liturgical worship service. We see an ark, uh, or excuse me, we see lampstands, uh, 10 lampstands, 
uh, and the lampstands represent the planets. They ultimately represent the seven churches, according to Apocalypse 1, 2, and 3. And we see the table of the showbread, which is a foreshadowing of the Eucharist. Inside the Holy of Holies, have the Ark of the Covenant, which is the uh, visible manifestation of God's presence with the Israelites. The Ark would go before them into battle, etc. And the Ark was a type of both the Virgin Mary, who would carry God inside of her in the Incarnation, and also a type of Christ, who would be God with us, Emmanuel, and also a type of the church and every individual believer. Thus, we can see that all the implements and elements of the temple correspond to their fulfillment in the priesthood of Christ. Thus, the priesthood of Christ includes, even still, altar priesthood, that is, the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, according to Hebrews, which is superior to the Aaronic priesthood, although both the Aaronic and the Melchizedekian priesthoods point to Christ. We find offering, we find sacrifice, we find real presence in the sense of Christ's body and blood. We find a holy place that is set off and yet opened. This is, for Orthodox, the significance of the veil being rent, which occurs during the liturgy when communion is given out. We see sacred time and sacred space marked off. We see iconic representations uh, on the walls and upon uh, every aspect of the worship. Thus, you can see that the incarnation is the real mystery that is the significance of the temple.